Based in Larkspur, California, Stephen A. Nielsen is a U.S. registered patent attorney with many years of experience in patent procurement and in achieving favorable results in federal court in the field of intellectual property litigation. Mr. Nielsen is the past chairperson of the intellectual property section of the Marin County Bar Association. Mr. Nielsen received his JD in 1987 from Bolt Hall, University of California at Berkeley, and also holds a BA in computer science. He may be contacted at steve at nielsenpatents.com, on his website, nielsenpatents.com, or via his LinkedIn page. Thank you, Bob, for that very kind and gracious introduction. You are a joy to work with, as is your company. Uh, today is February 26, 2021. I've had requests in the past to announce the date of the recording as the, uh, these things expire as to uh, getting credits. Thank you for coming today. Today, we're going to talk about uh, progress in diversity and inclusion in the legal profession. And perhaps that subject will bleed over into a greater society because I feel that the legal profession is perhaps a microcosm of uh, society at large. It's difficult to deal just with the legal profession and not talk about the overarching uh, issues that um, contribute to this subject and perhaps contribute to the progress that has been made. So I'm Steve Nielsen, N-I-E-L-S-E-N, -E Danish spelling. You can find my website at nielsenpatents.com and my phone number is on the screen, 415-461-2700. And I'm also on LinkedIn. And we've been doing this for about four years now. And I do get emails, I even get handwritten letters and I respond to every uh, piece of correspondence. And I do value the input of the uh, participants who watch this. Uh, I do take the comments seriously. And I think this year you'll see I've uh, changed a number of slides and made this to comport with uh, what people want to hear and what they're interested in. Even though we've been doing this for about four or five years, it's still relatively a newer requirement. Um, more bar associations, state bars have added the term DNI for diversity and inclusion. And there's even a new one called D, I, and E for equity, which uh, to me means sort of balancing the equation of who has what. Uh, we're not going to address that so much, but it does uh, uh, bleed into some of the topics that we're going to talk about today. So my past lectures and others that I've seen, and I'm sure I'm not the only DNI uh, video you've watched, talk about well-known concepts of implicit bias versus explicit bias. Implicit bias, as most of us know, are what sort of uh, preconceived notions are we exhibiting or are we feeling without even thinking about it, just sort of what's in our subconscious mind. A lot of other good lectures have talked on that, so we're not going to use our time up on that, but I'd be remiss to not just address that very interesting issue. And um, I'd be interested if uh, people want to share their own stories when they catch themselves in engaging in some unconscious or implicit bias. The goal of this presentation is to summarily or quickly go over the traditional concepts of the DNI movement. And the more interesting goal of this presentation is to address uh, the questions of how do we define progress in this subject and what progress has been made and what are the trends in diversity, inclusion, and equity and this presentation, as in past presentations, relies heavily on newly published work on the subject, uh, which was gathered and marshaled by Robert Moselle, a very experienced attorney and the CEO of CCE, the producer of this tape and presentation. And he has, and his company have a wonderful catalog of a lot of really interesting subjects that can be uh, downloaded or streamed, and they have a very good interface for uh, garnishing uh, credit with your state bar association. What are some of the innovative ideas in diversity? Um, in addition to the 
efforts made by a lot of large firms. There were some terrific new ideas which have percolated to the top uh, to support the attorneys can go a long ways in these organizations to attain their goals. I hope you can join me and others in this pursuit. So in other words, we're gonna talk about you know what's new and I can talk a bit about what I've done in this field that I think has helped. And hopefully others can see this and take some action. Hopefully we're not all just sitting here watching to get our credits where we will go out and mentor someone to be more active in our local bar association, even though with COVID, most of the meetings are by Zoom. There's still plenty of opportunity for us attorneys to make a difference to those uh, other attorneys who can benefit from our experience, our insight, and our camaraderie. A really good new resource is the Community Fund for Black Bar Applicants. And the website's given up here. And their mission uh, it was a, is to promote black bar exam applicants. And what they do is they uh, provide money to help achieve that goal. And the mission stems out of a desire to diversify the legal profession and raise the percentage of black attorneys in the United States, which is currently about 5%. And they want to get that to 20% in 2024. So the current literature has shown great strides in uh, getting some diversity and equity with black attorneys, both on the state level and then, as we'll talk about later, in the private sector as well. There's a really good resource called the Access Lex Center for Legal Education Excellence. The website's up here, and it's also called Lex Scholars for Access Lex. It's a diversity pipeline initiative aimed at learning more about effective methods for increasing law school diversity by providing more than 1,200 aspiring lawyers with resources and guidance to pursue their goal of attending law school. The uh, center is committed to understanding the barriers that impede access to law school for historically unrepresented groups and improving access to law school for all identifying actionable strategic and public policies to increase law school affordability and strengthening the value of a legal education. That's quite a mouthful of a sentence. And to me, that bleeds over into some other uh, slides we're gonna talk about of uh, zoning of all things, which gets into our equity and the affordability of law school and uh, the ability of people to have housing and other resources that delve into the equity occasion, equation of the DNI movement. So this Access Lex Center is also a grassroots initiative uh, to increase awareness of diversity and inclusion through CL programs like this one and others have fueled innovative ideas and programs around the country. And I do encourage everyone to visit the website. It's uh, access, A-C-C-E-S-S, lex, L-E-X dot org and learn more. I think this is a cutting edge website that talks about action items to help with this subject. What does the past literature tell us? Most of the past literature, I'm calling this pre-2020 information, uh, paints a bleak, dour picture, not giving really many of any coherent solutions. Uh, for example, in the book Diversity and Practice by Cambridge Studies and Law, published in 2016, the book description states, diversity and practice analyzes the disconnect between express commitments to diversity and practical achievements, revealing the often obscure systematic causes that drive persistent professional inequalities. So what that means to me in books of 2016, uh, it, there weren't any real action items described in the prior literature. I can go on on that, but I don't want to dwell on the past. The, I, I want to talk about the past. It, it helps us show the contrast as to what I think have been some very encouraging efforts in this past year, even despite uh, the COVID uh, pandemic that we're all living through. Um, the past literature talks about first-generational lawyers, and I think first-generational uh, college students having 
challenges. And this makes sense to me. Um, there's a movement of support by law schools and law firms. But then I always ask the question, can we expect big law firms to make a difference to a significant number of first generational lawyers? I don't think so. But what the current literature does, it's, it's again, getting away from big law and looking to other metrics and other methods uh, to increase diversity inclusion, uh, including the corporate level that we'll talk about shortly. In a prior presentation, I talked about um, pressure for law school ranking hurts women. There's an article in 2016 on this, and I, I got a lot of uh, interesting emails on this subject, and I've, I've looked at it again, and I, I don't agree with this anymore. Not that I agree with it to begin with, but I, I think it's flawed thinking, and I think women do very well in law school. They do very well at the larger firms, and they uh, most law schools have more women than men in them. So I think this thinking of 2016, I, we can legitimately say, is now outdated. I got an uh, email from one woman who said she read this slide and felt uh, that I was telling, saying that women shouldn't be lawyers, which is further from the truth, since I have twin daughters and I want them to do and be whatever they can. The current thinking is that women are now well represented in law school as well as starting classes of big law. And by big law, I'm talking about Skadden Arps, DLA, um, we all know Oric, the older, really wonderful, venerable, large law firms that have large corporate clients that have really wonderful billing rates, which I think help us solo practitioners because it makes our rates look very reasonable. So from past lectures, uh, some women reported back to me that I was sending a, a message that was anti-women in law. And as I mentioned before, nothing's further from that truth. There's also been some past articles about um, medicine and law having diversity problems. Um, it's interesting that in general, no well-paid industry looks like the general public for gender or race. So to me, the, the value of this older article uh, states that it's not just law or medicine, but it's just this country, maybe this world in general, where the well people in well-paying industries don't look like the general public. I think that is getting better, especially with the um, in, uh, equity aspect of the new DNI movement talking about equality and resources. So what does the current literature tell us? The big progress is that the big picture is progress is happening. And I'm pleasantly surprised by this because I grew up in the 70s and 80s and it just wasn't so ingrained uh, that there'd be change. I grew up uh, in the small town of Placerville, California, El Dorado County. And on a personal level, I've seen some change that I thought I would never see. So I, I, was, I grew up there six years old till I left for college and visited often. And uh, my hometown, I'm it's just a matter of fact, used to be called Hangtown during the gold rush. It was near uh, Sutter's Mill. And um, the town took pride in sort of this uh, Western justice and the uh, the town originally um, not only being named Hangtown, but the the town letterhead ha uh, had a noose on it, and then I grew up where people had the lapels of of a noose. So in my hometown, they've sort of grown up to the 21st century here, and that noose has been removed from the town letterhead. So I know this may sound sort of barbaric and. Uh, backwater, but to me, what this says in the most one of the most backwater places where I arguably where I grew up, change isn't occurring. It just happened four months ago, so progress is occurring. So the literature, as of February 2021, um, is is very encouraging. Uh, the Stanford Law Review. Uh, just elected its first Iranian American, um, a Muslim person, as the president of the Law Review. Uh, so this is a tangible stride for religious diversity. 
which then begs the question or leads to the question is how do we define diversity? That's a very broad and interesting subject. I'm, um, it can mean a lot of different things. And I think uh, religious diversity is as important as any other type of diversity. Um, what's also interesting as of February 2021 is some of the big five uh, big law firms uh, raise the bar on billable diversity and, and inclusion hours. So what does this mean as far as really making a difference? So one law firm is now allowing up to 125 billable hours per year in pre-approved pre diversity and inclusion work to count toward billable hours and bonuses. So big law, bless their heart, they're stepping up and they're saying, you know, you can build up to 125 hours for DNI projects, and it counts for your billable hours and your bonuses. That wasn't always the case. And other, uh, besides just the, the five biggest other uh, big law firms are following suit. So that's a tangible difference um, that can be made. And then that gets into the question, what can smaller firms do? Maybe you don't have the billing rates. What can they do to make a difference? And I do address that uh, toward the end of the lecture as to what can individual attorneys do on their own to help uh, address this problem. So that's, there's some very tangible results here that happened just in the last year. Um, also what's been noted is that black women lawyers, while relatively few in number, are supported and trusted by leadership. There's some really good work by Paula Edgar and her uh, website is on here. It's, um, she's a founding board member of the Black Law Big Law Pipeline. And she talks about um, how big law firms are starting to focus on black women attorneys and their diversity inclusion efforts. And she artfully addresses the issue. And also what's super interesting is she addresses the issue of large law firms um, stating that Black Lives Matter in their website um, and in their movement because there's a, a tension in any business and law firms are a business of not uh, plastering their websites with political statements because anytime you get political, you're gonna lose a certain segment of society. It's just a, a matter of fact. And the analogy is back in the day when we all wore suits and ties and sometimes vests, we'd go to Brick Brothers and buy our clothing. And the thought was that we don't, we want to dress nicely, but not offend anyone. So there's a danger of offending others with political statements. And what's interesting here is uh, she notes that the larger law firms are saying Black Lives Matter on the website and being part of that movement at the, at the risk of alienating a, a minority of clients. Uh, so that's good progress as well. And it sort of made me look at things as well, thinking, okay, I guess um, there are some courageous businesses out there, including some large law firms that are supporting this very worthy movement. In January of 2021, um, what, are, what, are, what were some of the current trends? Um, workers feared age bias, which to, that might have led to job loss. And there was a survey done, done that older workers were worried about job security. So I think age is a factor or division of diversity. And while there wasn't any hard evidence of age bias taking away jobs, there was definitely the concern of it. And I'm mean, going to just point out that I think people who are older have experience, they're, they're worldly, they've survived. And probably if they're worried about it, there's probably good um, reason for it. So that's sort of a slightly negative uh, trend, but I, I don't want to sugarcoat the presentation. What's also really interesting, in January 2021, there is a proposal for mandatory implicit bias training, uh, which was rejected by the Texas Bar Committee. So I was kind of shocked by this because I thought, you know, the, we're, we're all educated attorneys and we want, we want to help society. So why would uh, this training be rejected by the Texas Bar Committee? Maybe there are other factors I don't know about. So it's not all roses, but um, 
that's no, no, noteworthy. And maybe next year the Texas Bar Committee will uh, revisit the issue and I'll have something more cheerful report next year. So January 2021 came out with what to me was the most interesting news of the year. Coca-Cola, large company, been around for over 100 years, uh, well featured in Mad Men for their ads and what they do, um, has decided to, I don't know, they call it general counsel getting tough with law firms. I, I don't like that language, I would say. Uh, Coca-Cola General Counsel is now uh, requiring their law firms or outsourced law firms uh, to meet certain diversity goals. And one of the very tangible goals that they have set, and this, this may change by next year too, um, is that the, the firms that just that want to do work for Coca-Cola have to commit that at least 30% of associate and partner time on new matters will be billed by diverse lawyers. And so what does that mean to Coca-Cola? Well, of that amount, at least half of those billable hours uh, should go to black lawyers. So Coca-Cola is taking it upon itself to say, we want 30% of the billables to be of diverse lawyers and of that half to black lawyers. I am, I'm not privy to the exact um, verbal or written directions by Coca-Cola, but I find it interesting that Coca-Cola is going to decide uh, what areas of diversity it's going to promote. And as a private company, it's certainly willing or able to do that. So uh, hats off to Coca-Cola for taking charge and giving some very tangible requirements that I think will trickle down to the rest of the profession when clients say, we want diversity in our lawyers and firms the lawyers who don't exhibit the requisite request of diversity don't get the work. So to me, that seems like a very meaningful and powerful way to uh, move the ball on this subject. What's also interesting in corporate America is many large companies such as Cisco based here in San Francisco. It's a really interesting uh, routing company. They do a lot of things have very aggressive DNI departments and even have DNI officers and they seem to be very proactive in promoting the DNI movement. In December of 2020, the ABA Journal wrote, uh, structural racism is killing us. Now what? here are some policy recommendations. Uh, this article looks at the bigger picture items such as housing and healthcare. Now, this was really interesting to me. Uh, this is just about three months ago. Is it, get, it delves into the issue of diversity, inclusion, and equity. And the segue here, because I, I had trouble understanding when I heard this equity moniker in the DNI movement. But when I, when I read this article, um, it points out that. Uh, it deals with the bigger issue that is systemic in our society, such as housing and healthcare. And earlier, I talked about zoning ordinances for housing as hurting the equity movement. And there's a theory that uh, areas that are zoned for single family homes are exclusionary to the underserved populations because it's hard to get a single family house. But if, it's, if things are zoned for multifamily, you get a lower cost in condominiums to purchase or a lower cost in rental units. So that uh, encourages a, a better diversity within the neighborhood. And I think just across the, uh, the bridge here, Berkeley has, has now outlawed uh, single family housing zoning to comport with this new movement of equality. And this addresses the structural racism talked about in this article which then addresses this whole subject of how do we get a more diverse uh, field in the legal profession? Well, I think we've got to step back and deal with the whole systemic issue of equality, which the ABA Journal certainly does here in their December article, looking at the bigger uh, issues. And also they talk about healthcare. Uh, if you don't have healthcare, it becomes a very difficult issue which then goes into another diversity, inclusion, and equality topic that's very timely, something I was reading about today, is as the vaccines come out, 
uh, certain countries are, are having sort of a vaccination passport, if you will, where you get uh, documented that you've been vaccinated. And there's a fear here that we're going to get more inequality to the underserved communities who haven't been able to get health care or get themselves to get vaccinated for COVID. So these bigger issues, I think, are really worth looking at and figuring out why we have such inequality in our DNI and E community. Another issue that I've talked about in the past, but I think is, is still very important, is mental health, a point or a segment of diversity. And I, I think it is. Uh, there's a, a we used to talk about um, helping people who are disabled be better lawyers. We define it as disabilities, anything that could impact the practice of law. And I think that includes age for ageism. And I think uh, mental health or a stigma of having a mental health issue um, is an important point of diversity. And a lot of uh, law schools should consider having a wellness diversity representation integrated into their specific program. And here's a link uh, to that site as well. So that's, that's a question. I, I invite the emails and letters about is mental health a point of diversity? I think it is. And there are things we can do about it. There are organizations that uh, deal with uh, diffusing the stigma of it and encouraging all that can be done to deal with that issue. Belongingness. This is a new term to me for 2021. And it's an important aspect of the D and I and E movement in that we all want to belong to a group, uh, but our human nature can prejudice those who are not in our perceived group. And in the later slides, we're going to talk about that issue as well. So belongingness. And to me, what that means is being inclusive during uh, we're going to call it firm Zoom get-togethers and uh, making an effort to, you know, not leave a person behind. I know when um, you, know, you see somebody alone, just go talk. Does it go talk? Doesn't matter what they look like. Just to be inclusive in this term of belongingness. It's sort of a touchy-feely term for a guy in my demographic, but I'm I'm learning to embrace it. And when I read up on it, I thought, well, that makes sense, and that's a kinder. Uh, way to deal with the uh, DNI challenge. One of the best articles to date is 14 Ways to Discuss Diversity in Your Law Firm. And there's a link here. It's in the ABA Journal. And I've taken some quotes directly from the story cited above that talk about how do we deal with this? What can we do today to discuss this in your law firm or in your personal life? Here are the do's of discussing diversity, and it's worth my time to read them and, and comment upon them. Do you make it known that you want to be corrected if you say something potentially offensive? So in conversations, you just sort of mention this once in a while, and what I do, my experience, I'll say, hey, look, I'm of a certain demographic, and I'm going to say things that are offensive. Let me look at the hometown where I grew up, and I'm certainly open to being corrected or educated as to the newer ways of speaking and presenting. And people are very receptive to that. I mean, if you tell people your story of what biases you may have and where you grew up and what you, what you knew, um, other people are interested in that. And it sort of humanizes this whole journey of all of us becoming more uh, sensitive to the DNI cause. And also, do ask direct questions rather than awkwardly skirting the subject. So this works for all involved. And one of my favorite phrases is nothing sells like the truth. So if you directly state, hey, how do you feel about this? This is how I feel. No matter what side of the conversation you're on, um, there's a value to that. I think um, Northern Europeans are known for being very blunt and I think there's a beauty to that. 
I mean, um, we don't need to engage in Henry Kissinger's uh, theorem of measured ambiguity, uh, the bluntness uh, and directness wins the day. People appreciate the truth of the question. And then also do ask what you can do to promote diversity within the firm. And also that another question might be, do ask what you can do to promote diversity within your local bar association. As I talk about in later slides, it could be being involved in a mentor group to have some contact with people who have been poorly served in the past. So it's just getting hands on a one-to-one -one relationship with someone or people in your own community um, who could use uh, a little encouragement. Do promote open discussions of diversity, so don't make it a taboo subject. And then do be forgiving of politically incorrect statements made by others if the person had good intentions and is trying to learn. So that I saw a movie trailer and something offensive was stated and this uh, person said, well, I know you're doing the best you can with what you have. And I think that's a cheerful attitude and it brings the subject to the forefront. Uh, to be forgiving when you hear something that just hurts your ears and to say something in a gentle, kind way. Uh, we don't need to overreact. We don't need to yell at anyone because all of us are learned people and we enjoy learning and we enjoy progressing into the future. So I think this, this attitude or this ethos uh, really touched me. I think it's really worth uh, pondering, being forgiving, forgiving when we hear something that's offensive, talking it out and not going overboard with any anger. Here we go with something that's really interesting is do ensure the diverse employee has meaningful involvement in work if you advertise or pitch their diversity to obtain the work. So this goes to our Coca-Cola analogy that just came out last, this month. So what does that mean in real life? Um, if um, you've, you've pitched to Coca-Cola, you're gonna have a certain percentage of uh, traditionally underserved people working on their cases, make sure they have meaningful work. And I think that uh, goes hand in hand with being a good mentor. And it goes hand in hand with any law firm, big or small, developing attorneys so they can take over your business and you can retire someday. So it seems like a win-win deal. And it's kind of sad this ha even has to be mentioned here on this article, but it's worth talking about. So finding meaningful work and talking to people, what's meaningful to them, what do they want to know, and setting up the job just like a contractor uh, takes great pains to measure things out before the workers go execute it, take some pains to talk to people, see what, what do they want to do, what's going to work for everybody. Do let others know when they have offended someone or you. So, and this can be done in private in a quiet voice or maybe in public, but again, with the ethos of forgiveness and education, because a lot of people, they grew up in a hick town that they just don't know, it's all they know. And it, it's harder for younger people to even imagine how things were 40, 50 years ago. It was a different world. I'm sure some of the older uh, people of this audience will attest to that. Things that were done were said were egregious. And so younger people have to sort of understand where older people are coming from and just politely point things out and suggest a more eloquent, uh, learned, and effective way to communicate. The don'ts of discussing diversity. Do not be offended if a diverse person would rather not answer your questions or engage in a discussion. I think this is a great rule because some people don't wanna be defined by their ethnicity or diversity and they just wanna ignore it and just do their work and not worry about it. And I think that's a laudable goal and I respect that. And so the first thing out of the bat in this really good article, if a diverse person doesn't want to talk about it or answer, let it go, let them move on. It's their right and it's their freedom to not uh, be a de facto appointed representative of the movement. 
The next item here is do not make disparaging comments about any race, gender, or sexual orientation because you never know the background of your audience or their family. Well, let's change that. Don't make disparaging comments it's because it's not us. It's not educated. It's not advanced. It's not interesting. Um, it's like using foul language at a dinner party. It's, it shows a lack of education, a lack of creativity. Um, it shows just a lack of thought. So you, even though you don't know the background of the audience or the family, still, it's just, aren't we better than that? And so I would suggest we're a practice, we're a product of what we practice. And so I think in your most private conversations, you don't need to make such disparaging comments. Also, this idea that we're a product of what we practice. What if you get Mel Gibson drunk and you say some horrifically foul things? People are going to know that that's how you normally talk. So you just, it's just not a good idea to talk that way. Do not start a conversation about diversity with the phrase, so what are you? Um, need I say more? So you're, you're not asking somebody to sort of define themselves because uh, of what may be characteristics to you that seem to be apparent. Uh, this person may want to define themselves by being a great lawyer, uh, a violin player, I mean, a good parent, who knows? So you just say, what are you? It just sort of it just has a negative connotation, but I'm glad it's on this list because a lot of us from an older generation may not know that. So that, that's a really good rule just to not directly say, so what is your ethnicity or what are you? It's, it's just a weird question. The next issue, next don't is do not let it slide if attorneys in your office roll their eyes or belittle discussions of diversity. It is particularly important that leadership shut down this behavior. So it's very easy for some of us um, older lawyers from different parts of the country to roll our eyes, to just not believe it, and to um, uh, sort of downplay it. But things are changing and we can make a difference. So at every level, uh, don't roll your eyes or make belittling comments about the DNI and the movement. Also, do not force diverse attorneys to use the diversity for your convenience if it makes them uncomfortable. And maybe the way to avoid that is just to have a frank, straight up discussion with the attorneys in your firm or attorneys in your community about what makes them uncomfortable. Um, I think you'll find a whole bell curve of responses to that question. The next uh, don't is do not bring up someone else's diversity during an introduction to a new person, potential client. It will be apparent to everyone why you are bringing it up. So this is so painful. Hopefully none of us would do this anyway, but it, it's worth um, mentioning it as well. The next item, do not tell people who are diverse, but, but do not look diverse that they don't count. So what does this mean? Um, there could be people of diversity who may not be visibly uh, apparent as diverse. And we don't tell them they, quote, don't count. Uh, hopefully we're all smart enough to not do something like that. And also with our very broad definition of diversity, which I think evolves a bit every day, um, it's really hard to say who looks diverse and who doesn't and who is diverse and who isn't. Covering the basis of diversity and inclusion. The literature on achieving diversity in the law goes back for decades. And as I mentioned before, not a lot of great progress in the field using current metrics. Uh, there's no silver bullet systems known, but I think what we talk about later, there are things that can be done. And also in the prior slide, we talked about this could be a nationwide challenge reaching all professions, because as we noted before, there's not one high paying profession where the members uh, reflect uh, the general population. And that gets in again to the equity equation of the DNI movement. 
So what's really good news, and this has been going on for a couple of years here, is New York has a diversity and inclusion office. It's on the um, New York State Bar website and it talks about the DNI programs must relate to the practices of law and may include, among other things, implicit explicit bias, equal access to justice, serving a diverse population, diversity and inclusion initiatives in the legal profession, sensitivity to cultural and other differences when interacting with members of the public, judges, jurors, litigants, attorney, and court personnel. So what does that mean in plain English? What strikes me here is their DNI programs can relate to um, cultural differences and then differences in interacting with members of the public, but also serving a diverse population. So I think that encourages us to provide pro bono services to those who have been traditionally uh, disadvantaged it encourages us to uh, to reach out and get out of our office and go volunteer an hour at Lawyers of the Library. That's a great program that we can all do. And again, mentoring those and going to uh, DNI meetings here at the Marin County Bar Association. They're open to everyone. And a lot of us go. We have some really good, heartfelt discussions. So that's what that definition means to me or the requirements for New York for their programs. And also, what I like about the New York paradigm of e &I is there are categories of diversity, uh, which, which include race, ethnicity, national origin, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, religion, and then age or disability. And so I like the ideas of age and disability being counted as a point of diversity and then I would suggest also uh, perceived mental health as a, also a point or legitimate category of diversity. Um, diversity, I think, can mean anything that impedes the practice of law or interacting with others. So it could be age, a lack of computer skills, mobility challenges, uh, Rather an endless list, I'm going to give full credit to Matt White, the past president of our Marin County Bar Association, who's very active in our community in this movement. And I really like his idea of a very broad definition of diversity. And I like the fact that it includes a lack of computer skills. So the younger generation can certainly help us older people with simple things as computer skills and definitely help with this movement and mobility challenges, I think there's sort of a visual, maybe almost visceral uh, bias against those with mobility challenges. We may think they're slow-witted, uh, not bright, not capable. And that's an issue that I think we all need to examine within ourselves. Um, in Illinois, there's a one hour of diversity and inclusion requirement. And this requirement can be met by mentoring, I think uh, many other requirements, but I just stop there at mentoring because I think that's something that lawyers and small firms and big firms, we can all do. There are plenty of opportunities to mentor. In fact, a lot of the law schools have been reaching out to lawyers and asking if lawyers will mentor by Zoom. Um, Hastings has been reaching out to a lot of good lawyers. And it seems like a very uh, reasonable and win-win situation for all of us. And an advantage of COVID is that we're now more comfortable with Zoom. I know Zoom gets a bad rap for people to get you know, uh, burned out of Zoom calls. Well, I think you get burned out of any type of meetings. I wouldn't blame it on Zoom. And so I feel that um, there are a lot of good opportunities for us lawyers, small firm, big firm, solos, to mentor. And that's recognized by Illinois how the their one hour diversity inclusion uh, continuing legal education requirements can be met by mentoring. So you don't have to watch my video. You can just go mentor next year and get your credits, at least in Illinois. So that's a great way to do it. I think it's more productive and it's more active uh, than watching a video or going to a meeting. So as I mentioned in prior slides, or present prior presentations. 
my belief that mentoring and networking seem to be the answer. And this hasn't changed in the last couple of years. So what does the data show us that while women and diverse people are going to law school in greater numbers, they aren't reaching the top. Uh, the written work doesn't seem to offer a clear or agreed upon solution. Of course, this slide was written before Coca-Cola came out with this new ed edict. Um, mentoring and network groups seem to be the way to go. They make sense. It helps first generation lawyers who might also be first generation college students get used to the environments and provides a great support system. Uh, our diversity section of the Marin County Bar Association runs a program with great success, although it's been all by Zoom this last year. Um, also, our informal mixers have been popular in breaking the ice and it's good for inclusion. And we have had some Zoom uh, sessions where people show up and uh, it's not that painful. It's not that bad. So I would encourage with the Zoom to have the mixers actually saves a lot of travel time and people can talk and it also helps with sort of this uh, feeling of belongingness and also with this uh, social isolation that a lot of us can be feeling here during this pandemic. So diversity and inclusion based upon decades of perceived failure, we're not gonna solve the issue soon. Um, the issue seems to be less formidable as life is getting to be more of a, what I call a friendly feed experience where life is just uh, people in general are a little bit nicer than they were in the 70s and 80s. Um, this is my favorite story. Law, law firm softball games are the worst that not everybody knows how to play softball. It's, and it's, it's just a bad metric. It's just a bad idea uh, to try to get people to go to softball games. If people don't play well, they feel isolated. And there are other events as well where certain people just aren't going to have a good time and feel less than and not want to participate. Um, so pick events that are doable for all. Um, one thing I find uh, before COVID, we'd have these poker tournaments and everybody can play. Everybody's pretty equal. And that's been a lot of fun. There's other good examples, too, for mixers and events where people can just all be at the same level. Also in the DNI movement, I question the definition of progress. And I always think is our definition, what is our definition of reaching the top? It should be that be considered. And while I, I do like big law firms, I think they help the profession on a lot of levels and for a lot of reasons. Very few of us are going to work or survive at the large law firms. It takes a very special attorney to survive and make it there. And my hat goes off to them because some of the brightest and most interesting lawyers I work with are partners at the big law firms. Um, but how do we define success? Is making partner at a large law firm, is that a true and legitimate metric of success for a member of a diverse group? Uh, while we can all agree that everyone should have an equal chance at such a goal, how relevant is it in viewing diversity and inclusion? Not many partners at big firms, one, seem to be having a good time. Some do, just my personal observation, but also isn't the number of lawyers, the percentage in big law is so small. Why are we all so obsessed with big law? And you know, there's Law 360, there's all these news groups for lawyers, and it's, it seems to be all about big law for some reason. So is, that's something we want to rethink. Is running a solo or small firm considered success? And I think it is. Uh, for example, the uh, female-owned law firms have increased the rate of 4.5 times over all other law firms. So what this means is that we have this in Marin County, some female-owned law firms that are doing well, they're growing, they're strong and they just own it. They just say, hey, we're a lawyer, we're a law firm of females and they do a great job. We have some in labor law here in Marin County and I consider them very successful uh, on many levels. And I think that's another way to look at success to get away from big law, meaning that small firms can do well, female owned 
firms can do well, any firm can do well, getting away from this uh, uh, infatuation we all seem to have for big law. So another issue that comes up is how do we define bias? Because diversity, inclusion, equality, a lot of it hinges around this ugly concept of bias. And here are some definitions that I've sort of worked on that sort of describe it in different ways. And bias against can be a preconceived notion against those perceived to be in a different group. And I think first generational lawyers have a cultural and confidence bias. It's, it can be a, a different environment, a different experience, but hopefully the mentoring groups and bar meetings and parties um, can sort of help uh, ingratiating a first generation lawyer in the culture and give them some confidence in this new group. Another issue with bias is I think it goes down to sort of a genetic level. Um, and do we dare look at the work of social psychologists and their peer reviewed studies to look at maybe it's in our DNA to have sort of a, a general uh, bias against others in a group, whether they look like us or not, it's not just the definition of a group uh, can give us a bias against other groups and bias in favor of our own groups. Um, also, there are studies in group theory relevant when groups are defined by protected classes, such as race, uh, et cetera. Um, I think those studies are relevant when the groups are defined by protected classifications or defined by anything, or just a group could be defined by who gets picked to be in a group. And both groups of people can look substantially similar. But these group studies, I think, are very powerful and get into sort of our human behavior and our DNA and also crosses over with the concept we talked about earlier of implicit bias, a bias we don't even know about. So the studies by the psychologists, I think, are very relevant for us to just sort of look at to kind of figure out why are we the way we are. Um, also, another, and the, the, the big issue is that studies show that we just like people in our own groups. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a second here. So here's a proposed big picture approach. Is the reduction of bias in the enlightened self-interest of members of the legal profession? Should we be mindful of factors beyond the protected classifications to address, address issues of improper basis and improper discrimination? And should we discuss real world examples of successful bias diffusion? So these are issues I've talked about in the past, but I think they're still very relevant. And we talk about what is bias. We may have a bias for one type of food versus another. Of course, maybe we've tasted certain foods. So maybe it's a, a judgment and not a bias. And then we have the issue of mechanical bias, which, mean, which means to sort of urge a mechanic object in a certain direction. And I think that's relevant as we discuss our bias. And then we talked about sort of the group bias. Uh, we all have a perceived bias for one in our own perceived group and a distrust for others in another group. Um, and I would hope that we can study this in a factual and unemotional manner as well. Um, so the rest of the slides, we're out, we're out of time here, unfortunately. But if there's another uh, 20 slides here where I talk about these other issues, you're certainly welcome to, to go through them. But uh, that's really what I wanted to talk about during this presentation. Um, and I'll end on my favorite slide of this. Uh, a quote by Nelson Mandela, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but those who conquers that fear. So what does that mean to us? It means have a little courage to engage in the do's and don'ts we discussed above in dealing with diversity. Don't be afraid to speak your mind and say, hey, that offended me. 
or ask questions or make it known that if you say something stupid, you're all for being corrected on it. So that's where I want to end the verbal part here of the presentation. And I look forward to the emails and letters of people who watch this because I'm very open to the new ideas that come out and how I can make this program um, better in the future. Um, so I'll, I'll go to the end of the slide here. It has all my contact information here. And this is where you can write a letter, send an email, visit my website, uh, befriend me on LinkedIn if you want to uh, connect that way. And I do value and want to hear your thoughts on this very interesting issue. And again, I want to thank Robert Mazel for finding the, the newer material here and helping uh, organize the material as to what is going on today. Thank you very much for your attention.